you would get your green hymn books and turn to 162. Changed. 
The corruptible must put on incorruption. The mortal must put on immortality. We studied as we went through Corinthians studying one of the, I think the last session we had on Wednesday night, and it's a rerun for a lot of you, while Paul likened this new body that we have. He, he illustrates it this way. He talks about a grain of corn. And you take that grain of corn and you plant it. Except, and Paul says, except it dies, that cannot bring forth new life. And so you plant that grain of corn. Now, when, after a period of time, it comes forth, and it's still corn, but it don't look the same. It is not the same, but it still has the characteristic. When God raptures us up, the Bible says, we're, Paul said, I'm not sure what we're going to be like. We're going to be like Him. But well, regards to what I look like or don't look like, I'm thinking we're going to bear the resemblance that we have now. For my sake, I kind of hope that ain't true. But anyway, that's what I believe. But though we are different, though we may be different, we will be the personality we was on this earth. Y'all understand what I'm saying now? I'm still going to be me. I may be gorgeous George. <laughs> I may be uh, I may be ugly with it. But whatever I am, I'm still going to be me. The God is raptured up out of us from the earth so we can make personalities. Our personalities will be will be the same. So when the Lord comes back, there's no announcement. His, yeah, the silence of eternity will be broke by that shout both of the archangel and the trump of God. But just imagine now, get this in your mind. So here we are, you got airplane pilots as Christians. You got taxi drivers as Christians. You got people all over the world that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have confessed with their mouth the Lord Jesus and they have believed in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead. And the Bible says, when you do that, thou shalt be saved. All of a sudden, zap, they're zapped out of the planes and the taxis and, and the equipment. Can you imagine the chaos that takes place after the rapture upon this earth? Remember now, everybody here is not being raptured. It's just those who, who are saved. Amen. But now today, I want to talk to you on the subject, what will happen in heaven? After Jesus comes. After the rapture, what will happen in heaven? The Bible says that we're raptured up together. There won't be Baptist here, Methodist here, Presbyterian here. Everybody that's saved, regardless of their affiliation, regardless of their chain of thought, regardless of the theoretical thinking, if they know Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will be raptured up, the Bible says. So now here we are. We're moving into heaven or the place God has designed to have us when we're raptured up. Now then, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the first, second Corinthians, uh, second Corinthians chapter 5, oh, excuse me, second Corinthians chapter 5, verses... One through five. <clears throat> Let me get a scripture together here. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians five. Second, Second Corinthians five, nine and ten. Wherefore we labor. What if what being presence or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether it be good or bad. So the first thing we get to heaven, we've got to realize we're going to be happy. Amen. A lot of our days down here is not happy. Trouble, tribulation, heartache, death. But we're going to be happy. Two things are going to take place after uh, a little bit. There's going to be the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. Of the Lamb. What, is the, what is the judgment seat of Christ? The Bible talks about that, but this group is going to be happy 
they're going to be happy to be in heaven. 1,007 years later, from the time of the rapture, 1,007 years later, time will stop as we know it. Eternity will begin to roll. There will be no more time. So, we hear we've been there 10,000 years. I won't look at Brother Theo and say, Brother, you remember how it was 10,000 years ago when we got first got here? And that's the way we do now. We compare. But listen, when time stops, when the, when the thousand and seven years are up, time stops, it will all be one day. All eternity will be in one day. Now, if you can think with me, if you will, the greatest day you can ever remember. Maybe the day you got married. Uh, maybe the day you graduated high school. The happiest day you can ever remember. You multiply that by a million and you ain't there yet to tell you somebody of what's going on. And that will be the way that enormous one day. See, there is no sun. The Bible says that God is the sun. Amen. There will be no time. So it will be one enormous experience that has no time connected, connected to it. Can you imagine the joy that's in the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ? Think of what it cost Him in order for us to be raptured. It cost Him His life upon the cross. His life upon the cross. The Bible said that He suffered on the cross but for the joy that was set before him, he could see down through the ages. He knew when I would get saved. He knew when each one of you would get saved. He knew when everybody would get saved. And he looked forward to this time when he would rapture the church up and take them up to be with him. But we can be happy. Listen, all trouble, all tribulation, all heartache, it's all gone. There will never be another heartache come to either one of us or any of us on that day. Faith was what took us there. It was not by works. It was not by church membership. It was not by baptism. It was not by affiliation. But it was by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that shed on the cross that paid the penalty for our sins and by my profession of faith in Him, I lay hold on my inheritance that I'm enjoying at the rapture of the church. Man, we got a lot to look forward to. The great multitude will move in. The great multitude will move in. Seven years. We will be there seven years. Two things will take place. First, there is the judgment seat of Christ. Then there is the marriage supper of the Lamb. So, first of all, there is the judgment seat of Christ. What is the judgment seat of Christ? Only saints of God, only sane people will be here. Only sane people will be raptured. Only sane people will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. See You've got a lot of folks that say, well, God's just going to gather everybody up, take everybody up there and say, you get over there, you get over there. If that was true, folks, we wouldn't know if we saved or not. We wouldn't be saved until we got there and found out. But the Bible, Paul says, I know in whom I believe. Amen. Brother, the devil can't make me doubt getting saved. I know I'm saved. I know I'm redeemed and ready to go when the Lord comes after me, whether it be through death or the rapture. Paul said, there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ. Paul's been with the Lord 2,000 years. He didn't have to wait to, uh, another 1,000 or ever how long it takes when the Lord comes back in righteous. He knew, he knew then that he was saved. In the two things he's got to happen at the judgment seat. Well, actually three things at the judgment seat of Christ. Most people will die with unconfessed sins. Y'all hear what I'm saying there? Most people will die with unconfessed sins. When we confess our sins, the Bible says He is just and faithful to forgive us of our sins. And the Bible says He separates them from us as far as the east is from the west. He separates them and tosses them into the deepest sea and remembers them no more. But that's the confessed sin. Now what about those sins that you have? 
that you did not confess before you died. See, we don't know how we're going to die and when we're going to die, but we know one thing, if He don't come back, we're dying. We know that for sure. But what about, the, what about those unconfessed sins? That's one of the things the judgment seat of Christ does. It takes care of those un... At that judgment seat of Christ, it takes care. Those sins are forgiven and they're wiped out. Not only that, but the judgment seat of Christ not only takes care of the sins that we've unconfessed to God, but it takes care of any hard feelings we might have toward other folks. You know, somehow even, even Christian folks, sometimes they get, uh, they get kind of uh, what you were kind of use, kinkered toward each other. I guess that's a good, a good old country word, toward each other and, and have, some, have some hard feelings. And I've had folks tell me about uh, people being so mad at each other that one guy would sit over here and one guy would sit over there. But you know what? The judgment seat of Christ, they're going to reconcile all that and get all that, all that straightened out. Now then, but the main thing about the judgment seat of Christ is where we get our rewards. Now the word judgment seat is uh, from the word bema, and the Greek is Bema. And the Bema was not where a judge sat and passed a judgment. But it was, in fact, a place where the judge who judged the Olympic Games in Corinth sat. Isn't it interesting that he would use this? And he would judge who won and who lost. And he would take a crown of leaves that were made of garland up and he would put it on their heads. Uh, so, the, the, what is the judgment seat all about? It is where you and I get the rewards for the works done in the flesh. The works in the flesh don't save you. Works in the flesh will, uh, will assure you at the judgment seat of Christ, you'll get, your, you'll get your, your reward. Now, here's the way it works. Paul does such a great example. He uses the example of a foundation. And this foundation is Jesus Christ. And he says there's no foundation can be laid in the Christian life other than that which is laid in Jesus Christ. I can't lay it in Buddha. I can't lay it in no hand. It's got to be laid in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I got saved. I laid that foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every day, every day since then, I've been building on that foundation. And Paul says you can use gold, silver, and precious stone. You can use wood, hay, and stone. There's days when I load it down with wood, hay, and stone. I'll do one single good thing for the Lord. And there's other days when I get my act a little bit together, I, I put a little gold, silver, and precious stone on there. So here I am. I've got this foundation laid in Christ. I've got all the works of my life built on that thing. Now Paul said, it will be tried as if by fire. So it passes through the fire. Now what's left? The gold, silver, and precious stone. So here's some old boy. He ain't got nothing but wood, hay, and stubble. What about him? Paul says, but the man himself shall be saved. I'm glad Paul added that to it. I am so glad he added that to it. Now then, what? So what is the significance of that? So here I've got a crown. There are four kind of crowns that will be given at the judgment seat of Christ. Why is it so important that you understand uh, understand the second coming? We're going to go through the whole thing. Whole thing. Why is it important? Why did God lay it on my heart to preach this? Because unless you understand the second coming, unless you understand what's said in the different dispensations of time, the Bible will wind up contradicting itself. You see, there's many, there's many covenants we live under with God. First, there was a dispensation of the law. The word dispensation simply means a contract. There was a dispensation of the law in the Old Testament. Jesus came. There was a dispensation of grace. That what we're living, that's what we're living in now. <clears throat> when Jesus comes and rapture the church, we'll be living in the dispensation 
of the millennium reign of Jesus Christ. Now, in Matthew especially, Matthew talks about a lot of things that will go on during this thousand years. Now, if you try to take those things and put them over here in gray in the dispensation of grace, you get kind of the Bible don't make a whole lot of sense. So you see, once we can see through, once we have the knowledge of this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is why the Bible says this, it will make it a lot easier to interpret. Now, but let me get back to the crown. There are four crowns. Four crowns. Now, you know, a lot of times we look at folks and we think, man, he is piling on. He is piling on that gold, silver, and precious stone. But you know what God looks at? God don't look at what I might give or do. God looks at what's in my heart. Amen. See, he illustrates that. Uh, Remember the gospel, he told his disciples, you see that little lady? She came in and back then in the temple, they had a big thing where you pitched your, where you pitched your, uh, your offering in. There it was, the louder the noise it made. He said, you see that little lady? She just gave more than anybody. They said, wait a minute, she just said, put in two pennies. But Jesus said, all the others, they gave of their abundance, but she gave of her beauty. So God will look into my heart. God did not the normal things that you might think is normal that God will look at. God will look into my heart. There are four crowns. First of all, there is the incorruptible crown for faithful service. That is the folks who live their life for Jesus every day. They don't get corrupted. They don't backslide. They don't, they don't go out and start doing this and that. They live the Christian life the way it ought to be lived. Then there's the crown of righteousness for those who love His appearing. I thought that was interesting. There are folks who are just looking for Jesus to come back. They're waiting on Him to come back. You are praying for Jesus to come back. I have. I have. For the hardest times I've ever lived through in my life. The sickness of a child, of a grandchild. And I pray, God, why don't you come back? Why don't you come back? Right. Though I wouldn't want to live in those circumstances all the time, but you know, the prayer about hard it would be, hard to be every day. Lord, Lord, come back. Then there's a crown for faithful preachers. Why would He pick us out and give us a special one? The average lay person, you ain't got, a, you ain't got a clue. You ain't got a clue of the responsibility. That's laid on when God calls you to preach. You can forget about glory and you can forget about uh, uh, what the name might mean. Listen, you make a few trips to the funeral home. You can talk to people that are out in sin. Whatever class you might have associated with preachers, you can wipe it out right there. We're servants of God. Amen. That's all we are. Then there's a fourth crown, the crown of life. For those who were martyrs. Martyrs, the martyrs of the church time, of the early church time, of those men. Some were beheaded. Some Nero poured tire on some, and he would lie when he would open up a new street in Rome. He would take Christians and put them on crosses and pour tire over them and set them on fire and light the street. Listen, Christianity has not come down no paved road. Christianity has got to me and you by the suffering of many, many, many people. In Paul's day, in Paul's day, there was given those who won the events a crown made out of garland leaves. Look beautiful the day you got. Man, you could be so proud. You could walk down to the barber shop. You could walk down on the square. You could walk around the square. But your days were numbered. <laughs> that thing's going to turn in to a brush pile. And you're going to be laughed at what Paul said. An incorruptible crime. Now what is the significance of these crowns? What does that mean? Those crowns is simply this. It is a commission that we receive and we will be part of the governing process during this thousand year millennium reign. That's where human works enter in that for a thousand years. So we've all got our reward. 
We've all got our commission. Now what? Now comes the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage supper of the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 19, let me read this. Revelation. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And He said unto me, Right, are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said unto me, These things are true. Now He went on to talk about it in Ephesians. He said, Husband, love your wife, even as Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water of the, of the word, and he might present it to himself a glorious church, listen to this, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So God chose the most intimate thing that the human mind can possess, and that is the relationship between husband between husband and wife. It's interesting. The word present means to sit alongside. So God, God's going to sit alongside with no spot, no wrinkle. I never saw a bride with a wrinkle. <clears throat> never saw a bride with a wrinkle. Now I've married some pretty older folks in my time. But Avon came to her history. <laughs> without thought and without and without without weddings. Weddings. I tell you, I love weddings. Man, weddings are, but for every wedding you do, you do about ten funerals. Weddings are marvelous time. Man, I've married folks everywhere. On the front porch, on the back porch, in the barn, down by the pond. Opera Land Hotel, but the most interesting wedding I ever did was a coon hunter's wedding. <laughs> now I don't know what you're thinking. What kind of a dumb preacher would have a wedding with dogs? In? Actually, it was a beautiful wedding. Y'all you know, heard me tell this before. Some of you is in Cullen County on the front porch of a beautiful home, Bob Gibson's old place, and they pulled around a limousine in a walkway. It was about 30 yards, and halfway. They were sitting, like one dog on one side and one on the other while they were standing. One had a necktie on, one had a bow tie. And as the bride and the groom walked down, as they passed the dogs, the dogs sat down and just stared. And so here I am, two dogs staring down. And then with a calm face, with a dignified voice, I had to say, who gives it? <laughs> Who gives this woman in marriage? I, I, didn't, I didn't crack up there. Who gives this wedding? I have wonderful things. And that's why the Lord used this example of, of a wedding. A wedding is where two people are put together. Two people are put together for a lifetime. We shall have perfect harmony there. Can you imagine a bride and groom? Now that, it amazes me how bride and a groom act. It amazes me the customs. The men and I, they have a custom. The boy and the girl sit at the corner of the table and they take the boy and throw him over a fence. They don't know what the practicality of that is. But you notice, I've noticed, when that, when that uh, bride and groom after the wedding they would look at nobody but the bride and groom. I mean, they would even hardly sign, sign the marriage license. Well, hardly take their eyes off each other till they sign the marriage license. Now, they get over that. <laughs> <laughs> In a while, maybe they shouldn't get over it, but they do. But that wedding, that so much intensity, so much love, and what Jesus is saying is this. There is... There is love. There is love. We are God's people. So we've got our rewards. We've set with Christ at the wedding feast. And next Sunday we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about what's going on down here. At least part of it during that seven years tribulation. 
The main thing in life is to be <laughs> saved. Y'all agree with that? Amen. Amen. That's the main thing in life. That's the foundation you've got to lay first. How are we saved? By confessing Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and inviting Him into our heart. But you know, a lot of people don't get saved until something unusual happens. I heard a story about this. Year the, in the cemetery, they dug a deep hole to bury some stuff in, not people, the flowers and so forth, and they let you uncover. And this drunk was telling this, and he said, I stumbled through that cemetery and fell in. He said, I tried to get out, I couldn't. He said, in a minute, somebody accidentally fell in. And I said to him, you can't get out of here. <laughs> he said, but he did. <laughs> that's the kind of way it is when you get saved, you have a rude awakening. Y'all went through that, a rude awakening, man. I mean, what I thought about when I was under conviction was hell. I didn't want to go to hell. Man, I want to go to hell. And how to get there is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, if you'd like to go, uh, Make a professional faith to join the church. I want you to come as we get ready. Yvonne and Dan, y'all will come and get ready. Why are y'all getting ready? Let's pray. Bless the Lord God, we thank you, Lord. Lord, you're so good to us and bless us in so, so, so many ways, God. Now I pray, Lord, you bless this fine congregation. Lord, what a, what, a, what a wonderful church, Lord. We thank you for it. God, I don't have nothing to do with it. And I don't thank any individual would say they had a lot to do with it. But God is just by your mercy and your grace. God, give us patience to wait on you. God, give us grace to stay busy at the things you call us to do. Now, Lord, I ask, Lord, that you bless this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.